What cost victory? The arithmetic of war is a pitiless thing, a value judgment born of impossible circumstances. The coin of human lives spent cruelly or callously, or hoarded and guarded jealously. It is the burden of the commander to determine the toll, the coin to hand to the reaper that the day may be carried in the name of whatsoever cause the abominable war is being fought in the name of. It is the role of the commander to be spendthrift or miser, or aught along that spectrum. But even still, when one is renowned for the exacting care for which one spends the shillings of his men's lives, what then, when the price demanded cannot be countermanded? when the cost of victory is its ultimate necessity. This is a tale of such time, of retribution bought with lives. Know then that this is a record of the purgation of the Osiran Cybrids, of tolls demanded and tolls paid, a record of the debt of vengeance of the 13th Legion Ultramarines. The thirteenth Primarch, Robot Gulliman's transformation of the Ultramarines Legion, was less a revolution in the Legion's culture or operating practices, and more of a total refinement of every aspect of its war-making and logistical frameworks. The Primarch's assumption of command was seamless in the deference the Legion showed to him, but of course could not have come without him placing his unique mark upon their operational aims. Not content with simply wielding a weapon of war, Gilliman envisaged his new legion as a self-contained engine of imperialist conquest, one who would not simply leave a shattered enemy world to others to rebuild, but one that would work actively in their wake to create and maintain orderly, productive, and most importantly, loyal societies. The Legion was to him not simply the Astartes of the line, but all who aided them, from the serfs aboard their starships to the workers who manufactured their munitions. Supply chains, logistical corps, starship crews, all of these were as indivisible from the superhuman warriors as those selfsame warriors were from their bolt guns, and thus from the Imperium. The reforms of Gilliman were a total success. He and his legion built a track record of conquest and success in a space of time that astonished many within Imperial command. Records claim that during the first half-century of the Primarch's command, the Ultramarines reclaimed more worlds than any other single son of the Emperor had been thought capable of in such a space of time. The efforts expended by Gilliman and the Ultramarines on fine-tuning all aspects of their logistical and support frameworks and the worlds recently brought into compliance paid off dividends in full. Supply chains from these flourishing planets merely served to better maintain the speed of the Crusades' advance, bent entirely to the Imperial war machine, as well as having the benefit of spreading cohesive, and loyal imperial civilization to worlds left in the wake of the military advance. At the same time, the Ultramarines saw a veritable explosion in their numbers. Always in possession of one of the most stable gene seeds amongst the Legion as Astartes, when this was combined with Gilliman's own stabilizing genetic material and the Primarch's logistical skills, the resulting expansion surpassed the expectations of all, even, according to some, the Emperor himself. Though having yet reached the decisive, almost overwhelming numerical superiority they would one day hold over fellow legions, the Ultramarines, by 899 M30, were on the cusp of becoming so. 
their ranks, now approximating some 166,000 Astartes, placed them at the forefront of their peers. This was an opportune time for the Legion's ascendancy. The First Legion Dark Angels had, for almost two centuries, been the largest of the Eighteen, but had suffered grievous losses during the cataclysmic Third Rangdan Xenocide. Estimates place the First's casualties at some 50,000 Astartes during this campaign alone, a staggering quantity that would have nearly destroyed an Astartes Legion, save they themselves. Yet for all their successes, and the issues facing his brother's legions, Gilliman and his sons were painfully aware that a shadow lay upon the soul of the Ultramarines, a doubt in their own self-worth born of the disastrous intervention in the Osiris Cluster Rebellion decades prior. It had been the bloodiest engagement in the legion's history, costing them some 6,500 Astartes and the life of their former legion master, Gren Vesotho. Even besides the scale of the losses, horrendous for a legion that abhorred wasteful combat attrition, almost every aspect of the legion's intelligence gathering, strategic planning, and battlefield tactical acumen had utterly failed them. Current first chapter master Marius Gage's tenure had begun in its aftermath, yet for all of Gage's supremely competent leadership, for all their empire-building and conquest laurels that had come since, the stain of the Osiris Cluster remained, a canker nestling in the Legion's heart, unspoken, yet exerting a baleful power over their collective psyche. The architects of the disaster had been a collective of powerful Xenos entities referred to by the Imperium as the Osiran Cybrids. While the cluster for which they had been named had been pacified and returned to Imperial compliance, the Xenos themselves had seemingly escaped. All that had been left to do was kill the mind-wiped thrall husks that had once been the humanity of that series of planets. There had been no honor in the task, and worse yet, no closure. Gilliman knew the only way to purge the Legion of their doubts, of their dishonors, was the destruction of the Cybrids. To this end, ever since he had first reviewed after-action reports upon his reunification with his sons, the 13th Primarch had been orchestrating plans for the Cybrids' annihilation. He analyzed and reanalyzed every scrap of data, scrying the Legion's battle logs, examining gun picture footage, and even consulting psychanic auspex screeds gathered from the cogitators of the warships that had survived the disaster. Hoping to discern from even these microscopic fluctuations in etheric resonances. No detail for Gilliman was too small. The acumen of war was as vital, if not more so, than a warrior's individual valor. In the decades, his legion had gone from compliance to compliance, launched and concluded campaign after campaign, but the Primarch had never ceased to conduct theoretical battle scenarios against the wicked Xenos. He knew it was a near certainty that one day they would make a reappearance, they seemed, after all, to possess some desire or dependency upon creatures and species seemingly lesser than they. But decades passed, and of the Cybrids, there remained no credible sign. There had, of course, been rumors. The galaxy was a dark and terrible place, full of Xenos monstrosities that preyed upon imperial colonial expansion. Communication was likewise sporadic on the frontiers, carried as much by the crews of scout flotillas and expedition craft as it was by astrotelepathy. Unsubstantiated accounts were passed to the Legion's intelligence officers from rogue traders, occasional statements of mysterious slaughters, and mass disappearances. 
As mentioned, though, even within the fold of the expanding Imperium, this evidence was never conclusive as to the culprit. If anything, it could be more readily explained away as actions committed by more familiar, if of course no less horrid, Xenos species, such as the Crave, the Enslavers, or the Drukhari. Only one example was considered viable. Twenty-six years standard, after the Osiris Cluster incident, occurring on an agri-world in the vicinity of the Maelstrom, Maxilla Veritas. The planet had been robbed of 33% of its population in a single night, with the remainder simply lying down in their fields amongst their crops to just die. Their minds had been shattered irrevocably. They were husk things, nothing human in them remaining save their forms, and unto the loam of their world did they rot and return. Interdiction frigates dispatched by the Ultramarines arrived far too late. The trail of the Cybrids had long since gone cold. Only the corpses of their prey remained to attest to their passage. This remained the only considerably verifiable account of Cybrid activity until the closing months of 899M30, when a second and even more conclusive missive reached Gilliman. Crucially, this was not some after-action report of a massacre deemed nearly inexplicable. It was not that evidence of cybered activity had been discovered. The creatures themselves had been met upon the field of battle by the Twelfth Legion Astartes, at this point in history not yet reunited with their Primarch Angron, and continuing to bear the name Moorhounds. The expeditionary fleet that counted the Twelfth Legion contingent as its primary Astartes division was under the command of Praetor Erad Krug and was fighting in the southwestern volumes of the Great Crusade's frontier near the Eurydice Terminal. The Astartes of the Warhounds had been engaged in resisting an assault on the frontier outpost world by orc raiders from the self-styled Glortian Empire from the uncharted and unknown abysses beyond the planetary system. Though severely outnumbered by the rampaging Xenos pirates, the Twelfth Legion had held off the repeated orc incursions thanks to a series of savage boarding actions in near-orbital space and rapid, devastating assaults on orcoid planetfall areas. Reasoning, as always, that attack was the best form of defense, Warhound's Praetor Krug was not unwise in his approach. He was attempting to prevent the Xenos from gaining a foothold on the planet's surface, knowing full well that once an orc infestation is established, it becomes phenomenally difficult to fully uproot. It had been during the latest of these assaults, the largest yet by the orcs, that a previously unknown third party had engaged both sides in conflict. As a pair, of immense hourglass-shaped warships of unknown design appeared in the orbital volume. Quite how such vessels had emerged was just as mysterious. No etheric breaches had been detected by the admittedly distracted Imperial elements. The orcs reacted to their appearance as akin to an insect nest disturbed. Even at the height of their battle lust, they began to exhibit a frenzy quite above what is normal for their kind. They abandoned the planetary assault entirely, retreating wholesale from any ground operations to launch attacks in orbit with what can only be described as suicidal abandon. The Warhounds, never ones to look a gifted equine in its mandibles, took immediate advantage of this, regrouping and counterattacking as fast as they could manage. The assault, mounted upon the orcs' effectively unguarded flank by the Legion starships, was hugely successful, and inexplicably barely drew the attention of the Xenos, whose ramshackle starships continued their relentless and furious attacks upon the newcomers. Many simply rammed the hourglass ships, firing all guns as they did. 
The sheer momentum of the Warhound's advance carried them through the Orc flotilla until they were in weapons range of these strange new vessels. It was then the Twelfth Legion was to first encounter the abilities of these nightmarishly powerful aliens. The Cybrid vessels opened fire on the Astartes cruisers, lashing their void shields with abominably powerful energy discharge weaponry and sundering them all almost instantly. Teleport flare alarms blared out across the Imperial fleet as the Xenos mounted a boarding action all of their own, manifesting on board the ships of the Expeditionary Vanguard. In the corridor-to-corridor -corridor melee that ensued, only the savage obstinacy of the Warhounds allowed them to survive. Dozens of their own ships, not targeted for boarding actions but still prey to these newcomers, were obliterated by energy weapons, joining with the hundreds of orc vessels shattered and left as burning debris in the skies above Yuridici Terminal. Yet prevail, the Twelfth Legion ultimately did finally succeeding in repelling the Cybrids and forcing their ships into retreat. One Cybrid vessel, however, made a low pass on the planet's surface, its ground stations detecting sudden surges of strange energy readings across all Auspex nets. By the time word of the battle had reached the Ultramarines, it was already several Terran months standard out of date, thanks to the vagaries of astro-telepathic communications. Gilliman knew that his own orders, hurriedly dispatched in response and sealed under his authority as a Primarch and Lord Marshal Primus of the Great Crusade, orders for the Warhounds to hold at all costs and track the hourglass ships to their source, might arrive too late for any good to come of the matter. Regardless, the Primarch, never one for a sole option, immediately initiated his long planned strategy for combating the Cybrids. With a haste bordering upon the logistically impossible, an Ultramarine's retribution fleet was soon making full warp wake to Yuridici Terminal. Emerging into the gravity well of the star through the local Mandeville point, it is unlikely that even the mind of Gilliman himself could have predicted what the Ultramarines would find within the volume. The entire star system had been transformed into a spatial battleground, scattered throughout with wreckage and radioactive cascade echoes of lethal weapons fire. Dead, shattered hulks of orc and imperial warships both were strewn across all reaches of the system, along with other, less immediately identifiable craft. The very atmosphere of Eurydice Noctis the sole inhabitable world of the system, was blackened and poisoned, clearly the site of an absurdly intense conflict. Hanging in its orbital volume, amidst a veritable sea of wreckage, no fewer than seven of the colossal cybrid hourglass warships lay in the void. Preliminary auspex scans revealed that several bore the scars of heavy combat and were noticeably damaged, although to what degree none of the fleet's Mechanicum Magi could say. The fleet immediately came under weapons fire from orc survivors, with barks and escorts having survived the cataclysm now emerging from the debris fields to attack the newly arrived Imperials. These were sporadic and scattered, and easily repelled, but it allowed some hope of Astarte's survivors to be kindled amongst the Ultramarines. Auspex scan sweeps were widened, and against all odds, the Twelfth Legion were contacted on a narrowband Imperial Vox. A Warhound battlecruiser, identifying itself as the Cold Cerberus, had fled the battle to the safety of the system's outer ice moons, the craft having effected an emergency landing on one ice world to make critical repairs, although their situation, even now, seemed grim. On board were the last surviving legionaries of the Twelfth, a mere few hundred warhounds remaining from a force that had been ten times that number. Still, they were, miraculously, led by the terribly wounded 
but yet authoritative Erad Krug. The arrival of his cousins was a surprise for Krug, but a welcome one. The bellicose warhound Praetor communicated that he had received no orders to stand and fight against the Xenos, even from Gilliman. He had merely done so because that is what he would have done regardless. The tale he recounted to the Primarch was one entirely in line with the Ultramarines' records on actions taken by the Cybrids. Through means psychic, the aliens had influenced a significant segment of the orc population into attacking their own kind, and had clearly aimed to do so with the Imperial defenders of the system. Only the Warhounds had proven, as the Ultramarines had decades before, to be able to resist the psychanic maleficence of the Xenos, but many of their mortal crews had not. The baleful powers of the Cybrids had wrought great havoc upon both sides of the conflict, and the Imperial situation would have been rendered untenable were it not for the arrival in system of a massive Orcoid horde, seemingly the entire might of the Glorian Empire arriving en masse to join the fight. As before, the Xenos reacted to the Cybrids with the fury that surpassed the expectations of even their war-obsessed breed. Mechanicum Biologus adepts aboard the Retribution fleet theorized that, given the Orcoid species' fungal nature and seemingly low-yield collective psychic link, they had been reacting to the intrusion of the Cybrids into the minds of their kin, seeking revenge and to expunge the taint the Cybrids represented. In turn, reported Praetor Krug, more of the massive hourglass starships of the Cybrids had arrived, and in their wake had come thousands of enslaved Xenos warriors and ships, both of the Orcoid strain and dozens more besides. Several of the starships of these random flotillas were known by even the lexicanic data cores of Imperial starships, having been lost in local sectors many years hence. Eurydice Terminal had become a killing star, said the Warhound, a place of wanton destruction, drawing in whole armies to their doom like some sort of vortex. The Ultramarines were now just its latest victims. Such an unexpected and profoundly new situation may have unmanned even a seasoned commander. Gilliman, however, had spent years working on theoretical after theoretical to combat the Cybrids, using every iota of effective combat data his extremely diligent legion had recorded even decades before. Now the practical was finally ready to unfold. The central tenant to be exploited lay within the nature of the enemy itself. It was the Primarch's supposition that the Cybrids, semi-vaporous entities, were extremely few in number compared to their legions of mind-shackled slaves. Battles the Xenos engaged in were to be fought by proxy, the aliens only taking to the field themselves in extremis. Their own casualties would thus meant to be kept ideally as low as possible. Gilliman had immediately ordered intense auspex scans to be conducted of the strange hourglass ships, to bolster the theoretical currently being formed. The sensorium suites confirmed what the 13th Primarch had suspected. The ships, for all their formidable weaponry and advanced technology, were more akin to motile space stations. The actual areas given over to weapons batteries or livable space was minimal. The starships contained within them vast cargo spaces given over to provisions and supplies, everything that would be needed to ensure total self-sufficiency. Gilliman's musings were now presumed correct. The Cybrids were a nomadic species, possessing no centralized realm. Herein lay the explanation for the Imperium's scant contact with them, and the lack of any discernible region of the galaxy from whence their threat might be penned in and ended. They were wanderers, 
carrying their whole world with them as they roved. The 13th Legion could yet be in a position to end them once and for all. For a Primarch so renowned for the scope and detail of his strategic planning, Gilliman's plan of attack in this theatre was almost shockingly direct. There would be no pause for long-range void bombardment, the typical opening salvo of any space-based conflict. Rather, the Ultramarines would engage in a full-scale boarding assault with next to no prologue. 100,000 Astartes were pointed en masse directly at the Cybrids and unleashed. Unlike the Legion's previous conflict with the Xenos, where they had been pinned in place and slowly overwhelmed by the Mind Thralls, the Primarch's intention was now to engage in a reversal of such fortunes. This day, the Cybrids would be the one facing a horde of unstoppable enemies bent on their annihilation. Engines aboard the Legion's fleet flared to maximum as burn was ordered, the Primarch intending to deliver his warriors to the heart of the enemy with all haste their ships could safely manage. A dozen battle barges, led by the Gloriana class McCrag's honor, powered in system, supported by a score of cruisers. Two battleships, the Spear of Konor and the Thunder of Hera, commanded by Marius Gage and Severin Vale respectively, split off from the Primarch with their own battle barge flotillas, while the heaviest battle cruisers of the fleet formed a rear guard behind these three splinters. This last echelon, as the Retribution fleet enclosed the Cybrids within the vast volume of space, itself broke off on the final approach, sweeping further afield to ensure the Xenos had no void through which to flee. The Cybrid response, initially, was to close ranks. The hourglass starships moved into a close formation and threw out their longest-range weaponry, gravity pulses that were designed to sunder the oncoming Astartes formations, as well as deflect any incoming bombardment, akin, if one will, to a flak barrage on an Imperial battleship. All too late, the aliens realized there was to be no bombardment, and instead, the Astartes ships rode the gravitic turbulence with apparent ease. Gilliman had ordered the crews and captains of his vanguard relentlessly drilled in such maneuvers, endless simulations of spatial distortion navigation honing their skills. While a few ships fell slightly out of step with the rest, the juggernaut of Imperial battleships was barely affected. The Cybrids, recognizing the situation, attempted to scatter, but their ships were ungainly, locked into the orbital pull of the planet itself. With mere kilometers separating the two fleets, the Ultramarines unleashed a single broadside, every weapon battery that could, firing at the Xenos ships. Before even the afterimage of a thousand macro cannon shots had faded, the boarding gunships of the Legion had launched from their flight bays. Lashing out with energy whip weapons, the Cybrids attempted to forestall the assault, but such was the sheer number of the 13th Legion, and the distance between the foes, that nothing could halt the Astartes' advance. The fleet and their landers engulfed the Xenos utterly. Not content with merely launching gunships and boarding pods, Gilliman had his battle barges and cruisers bodily ram the hourglass alien vessels, their prows lodging in the strange clockwork-esque cores, deploying grappling nets and boarding bridges into the hulls of the enemy and disgorging those Astartes yet still aboard into the maze-like tunnels. The Ultramarines were now akin to vulpines amidst the Ardfowl. The Cybrids, without their exoskeletal armorial technology, were ghoulish, half-vaporous things, forms redolent of phantasms of Terran myth. They were still phenomenally lethal, and, when cornered, fought with all the savagery of the desperate, lashing out with telekinetic fury and psychokinetic energy. 
But the ultramarines would not be denied, and such was their numbers that even should one fall, another ten would immediately be present to avenge him. Shield-bearing in Victoriae and Legion Terminator squads powered the vanguard onwards, corralling, cornering, and butchering the hated foe. Wonders and horrors both abounded within the holds of the Cybrid vessels. Where one ultramarine squad would happen upon a vault containing treasures and riches plundered from unknowable civilizations long dead, another breaching team would sunder the locks around a hideous preservation abattoir wherein the cephalovoric aliens kept the still-living heads of their victims for later consumption. The latter only stoked the already blazing thirst for vengeance in the 13th Legion. Memory stirred within many of the veterans a horror of the Osiris Cluster all those decades before. Gilliman himself was to claim the honor of breaching the innermost chamber of the alien ship his Tacticae officers had designated the lead. The master being of the Cybrids was unlike its subordinate creatures in form. A towering, multi-limbed thing, equine of visage, three times the height of the Primarch, it screamed ceramite-sundering shockwaves at the intruding Astartes. The psychokinetic deluge stalled even Gilliman's Terminator life wards. But the Primarch, with the Legion's chief librarian, Aroth Ptolemy, charged the vile alien. The Cybrid King drew forth in clawed arms weapons strange and terrible, responding in otherworldly fury, only to come under direct mental assault by the Ultramarine Psyker. Ptolemy locked the Legion's foe into a battle of minds, combating the Xenos on planes etheric. Gilliman, for his part, tore at the creature's body. The Cybrid King's mental fortitude was superlative, allowing it to engage both foes at once. But it was no match for the combined onslaught. Gilliman tore the thing limb from limb, ripping the alien's glowing brain from within its skull and crushing it underfoot. The raw power of the Cybrid's mind had wholly overcome Ptolemy. The librarian was a husk, still aflame, his flesh seared off his bones. But his sacrifice, with it he had bought his lord victory and his legion their vengeance. One by one the hourglass starships succumbed to the fury of the legion torn asunder by demolition charges placed by the Ultramarines diligently as they advanced, or shredded in the crossfire between Imperial battleships. Several made wake out system, only to be pinpointed for destruction by the waiting Ultramarines' reserves. As the Cybrids died, the Orcs under their thrall did too, leaving only the battered and bruised remnants of the as-yet unenslaved Orcs. These the Ultramarines made quick work of, chasing down fleeing scrap ships and committing to death their inhabitants. The price of the battle had been high. Several thousand legionary casualties, many of them veterans of the Legion's Terran roots. These, of course, had been eager to be the first into battle to expunge the shame they yet bore for the Osiris Cluster disaster. This engagement, the Battle of Eurydice Terminal, remains in Ultramarine's history a curious example of the Legion's indelible practicality. Ever one to eschew any form of combat that demanded by its nature heavy losses of manpower, for the Legion this sole action would forever dispel the myth that they would never pay the cost that was demanded of them. Gilliman's practical in this purgation had been what had carried the day. The advantages the Cybrids had held in the Osiris Cluster debacle were wholly denied to them. When sacrifice was the cost of victory, when it was the most effective and efficient means to win the day, the Ultramarines would gladly and rightly pay it. They simply preferred not to. With the annihilation of the Cybrids, the 13th Legion had displayed the fervor and determination many throughout the Imperium thought they lacked and had paid a price of vengeance quite willingly. 
it would not be the first time in the tragedies of what were to come that the Ultramarines Legion would be asked to pay this toll, and it would not be the final time they would do so willingly, for what revenge they needed to claim. Ave Imperator. Gloria in Excelsis Terra. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash Oculus Imperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.